Welcome to the Mercy Cast, where we're learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. I'm your host, Raleigh Sadler. Today, I want to talk about grief and happiness. Sometimes we think that these two cannot go together, and we avoid grief for the sake of being happy. We look at our friends who are going through something, and we just kind of give them the hard time. Like, why can't you just get over it? Why can't you just move on? But oftentimes when we're going through something, we have to allow that to cycle through. We have to work through what we're experiencing. And, you know, with grief, it's not set on any specific timeline. Sometimes it takes longer. But the question I want to ask today is, can we be happy while we're being sad? Is there a way that we can experience both emotions simultaneously? Because at the end, that's what they are. They're emotions. They're emotions experienced by us in a moment-by-moment basis. And so how can we process this while living life as we were intended? We all have experienced the death of someone close to us. In Emily's case, she experienced the death of her husband. She remarried only to live through the death of her next husband. In the aftermath, Emily's wondering about what her purpose can be now. Today, I'm joined by Emily Thoreau Threat, the author of the Grief and Happiness Handbook and the host of the Grief and Happiness Podcast. Emily, welcome to the Mercy Cast. Aloha. Thank you so much for inviting me. And so if you didn't know, Emily is in Hawaii and you will quite possibly hear the rooster in the background that is just crowing. I think this is a very confused rooster. This rooster doesn't really know if it's morning or night. It's just living its best life. So if you hear that. (laughs) Just know that we're very real here at the Mercy Cast. <laughs> and so, Emily, you have written on this idea of grief and happiness. You have a podcast where you're dealing with this content consistently. My question is when you were processing the death of your husbands, what happened next? Like, how did you find your purpose in this? That's an, an interesting question. After Jacques, my, my first husband, who died, When he transitioned, I was, I was kind of lost, which was Mm -hmm. unusual because he was an expert in the field. He was a philosophy professor and a bioethicist. And what he worked on was the ethics of living and dying. And he ran a bereavement support group. He was instrumental in bringing hospice to the community where he was. And so he, he really, he got death and dying, but when it came to him, I think he didn't think that he was really going to die. <laughs> right, right up until like the last moment when it finally dawned on him. And so that left me kind of lost. And I didn't do much but sit for that first year. I, I did go to work and oh, come home sense. and that was it. Because I, I just, I couldn't figure out what to do next or what I was supposed to do. And I, I was able to, uh, interestingly, change all that. Jacques died in February, and when New Year's came, it was almost a, a year later, I thought, I don't want to make New Year's resolutions because that hasn't worked for me in the past. So what I'm going to do is figure out one thing I'm going to do this year and set my intention for that and then see what happens. So I set my intention to accept invitations. Now, I don't know why that came to me because nobody was inviting me to do anything or go anywhere, <laughs> but it was so strong. I thought, I'm, I'm just going to go with it and see what happens. And the invitations started coming and things that I'd never done before, people I didn't know, just incredible experiences. And it allowed me to start sort of breathing again to kind of be opening up and being willing to be around people and being able to talk and that sort of thing. And when I got to that point was when I met Ron and I had decided that I was never going to get married again because I I didn't feel like I was unmarried from shock. We'd been married for 22 years. And just because he died didn't mean I didn't feel the same about him as I did before. So it, it took me a while to be able to be comfortable in a new relationship. But I'm I'm glad that I opened up to that because I had a a beautiful relationship with Ron for 10 years before he died. And he had lived on Maui a long time before I met him. 
And he brought me here on our honeymoon and we kept coming back to visit. And when he realized how sick he was, he said, you know, I would really like to be in Maui. And I, I understood that he was saying that that was where he wanted to come for his final days of this existence. So we did, and we were here two years before he left. And then it's like, okay, now what do I do? Yeah. And I'm a writer. I taught writing at the university level for most of my career and have written college textbooks. And I really love writing. And so I would write for myself, not for anybody else to read, but just write about things. And the more I wrote, the better I felt. And I realized that what I was doing was trying to figure out what my purpose was now, because everything about my life had changed at that point. And what I discovered was that I wanted to help other people who were going through grief in a way that I wasn't finding out there, because I, I wanted to be positive and I wanted to be comfortable and it's through writing that was helping me and I was doing different exercises for me. And I thought, you know, I could really help other people who are dealing with loss if I taught them how to write this way too. So I created a writing group and it worked. It really helped them a lot. And that, that went on, I, I wrote quite a bit. And they, the other people in the group wrote too and they, they just loved it. And then uh, several months after Ron died, a good friend died, and he just dropped dead one night on his way home mm -hmm. from work. And he was much younger than Ron, and they, they were really close. And I was very concerned about his wife. And, of course, she was on the mainland, and I was in Hawaii, and, you know, I couldn't go over and hold her hand or, you know, whatever I would have done had I been there in person. Yeah. yeah. So I decided I, I would write her a card every week for the first year so that it'd be 52 cards and I thought that that was a good idea to write it on different experiences that I'd had different things to anticipate when you're grieving and I thought I'd better figure out if I have 52 different things I could say so I made a list before I started and when I finished that list I looked at it and I said this is an outline for a book so that's mm. where my books came from. And I developed them into two, two books that each had 26 chapters apiece because 52 chapters is a lot for a book. Yeah. So it, it, that worked out really well. But af after that, after my first book was published, I was thinking that I felt like something was missing. I really liked teaching the writing and the people really liked doing the writing, but I still felt like there was something missing. And I remembered I had written, or not written, I read a book by Marcy Shima called How Happy for No Reason after Jacques had died. I, I read that. And so I, I was looking back through that and thought, you know, this makes sense because I felt like I didn't have a reason to be happy since both my husbands died. But I also realized that I didn't have to have a reason to be happy, that I could be happy anyway. And how could I include that with the grief? So I discovered that Marcy had created a program to become a happy for no reason certified trainer. So I thought, I'm, I'm just going to go through that and see what I can learn. And I just loved it. I learned so much. And the good thing about her program was once you were certified, you could do anything you wanted to with the material that you learned in the training, which was great because I thought, I'm going to apply this to grief. Because people need to know that they can be happy and they can be sad at the same time. And you, you kind of have to. It's a, like a balancing act. It's something that you need to go through. So I created my Grief and Happiness podcast. And initially people were going, those two words don't go together. <laughs> you can't do that. It's not going to work. Well, my podcast is very popular. <laughs> I've got 200 episodes now. And it's going very well, but I thought I want to add that to my writing groups that I've been doing. But again, I was getting that feedback that grief and happiness don't go together. So I invited a bunch of people I'd known at different times throughout my lifetime to do like a pilot program with me for it. And I explained to them the whole thing and they actually went through what a gathering would be like where they wrote together and learned happiness practices. And then we talked about it afterwards. And they said, absolutely, 
this is something that we need in society mm-hmm. today is for people to, to know that they can do that. And I said, my only challenge is I don't want to charge anybody for coming to this, but it, it does cost money to put the class together and have it online and all that sort of thing. So they said, well, then we'll just form a nonprofit organization for you. And that can support what you're doing so that people will see the value of somebody supporting them being able to come that somebody's paying for it. They just don't have to. And people have really responded well to that. And that the it program is going very well now. We've, it's been running for two years and, and people just love it. You talk about your response to the death of Jacques. You wanted to focus on one thing that year rather than making some extravagant resolution. You're mm-hmm. saying, okay, what's one thing I can do? And I think this is just such a teachable moment for all of us because when we're going through grief, I don't know about you, Emily, or listener, I don't know kind of where you're at, but what I've found is that when I am going through something, it can feel like I can't do anything. I can just feel so overwhelmed. But if I look at that and say, what's one thing I can do? Lower the bar. What's one thing I can actually accomplish today? And I love how you did that. And you said, this year, I'm going to accept invitations. And you just had a gut feeling that this was what you were supposed to do. It's like you were being open where your grief is almost saying, be closed, close everyone off, suffer in silence. And you're like, no, I'm going to be open to see what's coming. And then that led you to run because you were open. And then you keep pulling this thread and then you start thinking, well, I don't really have to have a reason to be happy. I can be happy and sad at the same time. Through what you suffered, through that adversity, you found your purpose. And then what worked for you, you started realizing it's working for other people and people are writing out their stories and they're, they're starting to heal and they're learning that they can live in this paradox of happiness and sadness at the same time. And I think that's incredible because a lot of us feel like we have to be on our A game. And unless we're not on our A game, then we're never going to experience the fullness of life. But I don't know, as I'm talking to you, it sounds like we can experience a full life even when we have conflicting emotions. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Absolutely. The, the thing you, you mentioned one word, and that was being open. And I think that was the key to everything. By, by saying that I would accept invitations, I realized I was open to my life, to experiencing it and not to just... I, I know a lot of times people have told me when they're grieving, they feel like they just kind of cease to exist, that they're not the same person anymore. And so they, they aren't sure who they are. And I, I could relate to that because that's kind of how I felt after Jacques died. But I realized when I accepted invitations, every invitation that I accepted gave me new experiences, doing different things that I'd never thought of before. And it kind of opened up my thinking in general. And I could see how much was out there beyond what I had experienced so far that was yet for me to experience. And by being open to that, I could start having actually joy in my life. It, it really, really made a difference. I felt like I was making a difference in my community. I felt like I was making a difference for the people that I did things with. And that I was definitely making a difference for me. And it it was great. Well, it sounds like you've experienced death, but there was kind of a birth that came out of this, like something Mm -hmm. new came. You started experiencing joy. You found your purpose. And I think a lot of us, as we're going through funks or whatever, a lot of times it can be connected to this feeling of purposelessness. You know, we just don't know why we're here. We don't know if we're even making a difference, if we even matter. And the truth is that you do. No matter where you are, you matter. And I think we're getting these opportunities on a daily basis to tap into what's happening. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. You said yes, and it led you down a road that you never would have thought you would go down. Like when you were first starting out in the academic sphere and you were writing textbooks and you were teaching at the university level, did you ever think, you know what? One day I'm going to be a grief and happiness leader. Like I'm going to be, this is going to be what I focus on. Did you ever see that happening? 
I didn't at all. And that's, that's really interesting that you pointed that out because one thing I noticed when I was, was teaching at the university, when I first started teaching, they usually have the starting teachers start off with the lower classes, the people that were really struggling and got admitted to the university on special circumstances, but they really didn't know how to write. And when I would work with them, I realized that they had absolutely no idea why they were there unless they were an athlete and they came to play sports and they had to take classes because of that. But the other ones that that were in the class just didn't know why they were there. And when they didn't know, they didn't really have a purpose. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't have any idea. I was in Central California and there there were lots of farm laborers where they're the ones that got admitted that Uh, maybe wouldn't have qualified under different circumstances. And so they didn't have the role models in their family of doing something other than what their families had always done. They just didn't have the framework of what was available out there. And I really worked to have them start opening up and, and seeing what they could do in their lifetimes. And it was really wonderful to see them start to think beyond the box And a lot of times when people die, especially when it's an unanticipated death, the person, the griever, it it just has their, their whole frame of how they exist is different. And they don't know what to do with that. They, they don't know how to humpty dumpty put the pieces back together again because they just feel lost. And through writing and and doing things that they do with that and by meeting with other people who are also dealing with grief, they can see that they're not the only one because a lot of times they feel like nobody could feel this bad. Nobody knows how I'm feeling. But when you can get together with other people who are grieving and do something positive, it can really make a difference and get you to be able to start to move forward. I don't say people heal from grief. I say they move forward in it. That is a great distinction to make because I think we want to just put grief away from us. We want to push it away and pretend or deny, like pretend it doesn't exist or deny that it exists rather than accepting it, rather than owning it and saying, okay, like this is a part of me right now. This is where I'm at and that's okay. You mentioned how the griever often feels lost how they don't know necessarily how to get back on track so that they can move forward. They don't know how to return to what they knew as normalcy. How do we navigate that when we're grieving? How do we, I I don't want to say get back to where we were because that may never happen, but how do we move forward? Well, that that's, we mentioned that earlier with being open. Mm. When, when you can get to the point where you say, okay, now what am I supposed to do? And sit with that, you know, meditate on it, write in your journal about it. Wait, what am I supposed to do? And that's, that was one of the things that I wrote in, in my journal when I was writing after Ron died. I just wasn't sure what kind of move I was supposed to make or who I was supposed to be with because I was, I was pretty much alone since we had moved here just two years before, and I knew some neighbors. But besides that, I hadn't really met a lot of people on the island because I was dealing with his health and and all that that entailed. So I thought, do I go back to the mainland? What do I do? Mm -hmm. And if I just sat there and let that bounce around in my head, it got nowhere. Right. Because it, it just, you just, I kept getting more confused. But the process of writing it down, I'd, I'd go, okay, I'm in this situation. What can I do? What do I want to do? What was my idea of my best life at that point? And I I would write about things like that. And when you go through the process of actually writing them down, it's more than having those ideas just bounce around in your head. But you get them down in a way that you can look back at them and say, oh, yeah, I remember when I wrote that, and this is what I wrote, and why aren't I doing that? It sounded like a good idea at the time. You know? yeah, yeah. Well, and you mentioned navigating this through writing things down. Mm-hmm. Why do you think writing helps us process 
Oh, I think it's because we always think we're going to remember things. You know, Uh I I have a a challenge with that. I have on my phone an an app that's just notes. And I have learned that I need to write down things that I need to remember in there. Because otherwise, I go, oh, I'll remember that. And an hour later, I'll go, what was I supposed to remember for? So the, the process of actually writing it down kind of builds those pathways with your brain and the, the well, that's a fascinating way your brain works. The, the, the more you do it and the more concrete it is, the more you can hang on to it. And when you can hang on to what it is that you want to do and you focus on something like I focused on, what's my purpose in my life now? Yeah. Because I was kind of clear on it up until that point. And all of a sudden, it was, I felt like all that was gone. Everything in the past was essentially gone. I still had friends, like on the mainland, I had plenty of friends. I still, I had a home. That sort of thing was gone. I didn't have to worry about that. But my personally, it was what am I supposed to do? And how am I going to best enjoy my life? And how am I going to do something meaningful? And what do I really want to do? And when you write it down and you come back the next day, you say, oh, yeah, I want to think about that some more because that was a good idea. And you don't have to do everything that you wrote down. You know, you can cross some things out or just ignore them and go on to the next thing. Because it's it's like imprinting the things. When I What I came up with was... A, a, kind of a purpose statement that I use. And that was that I wanted to provide comfort, support, love, and happiness to people who are dealing with loss. Mm. And that's kind of a big umbrella. But the process of putting those words together gave me something that I could focus on. And when I would be thinking about doing something, I'd go, okay, how does that fit into my purpose? And it was, it really helped me a lot. Yeah, because now you have a true north. Mm-hmm. And I think when we're going through things, it's very easy just to feel lost in the storm and not knowing. We're f- we feel like the world is happening to us rather than we're happening to the world. You know, it's just yeah. it's very easy to feel out of control. And when you can say, no, this is my compass. I don't need the whole runway. I just need the next three to five feet so that I can mm-hmm. keep walking forward. As you were processing that, did you ever get to a point where you're like, I want to see the end of the story? Or were you able to kind of sit in like, no, I'm fine with the next three to five feet and I'm going to enjoy it and I'm going to be present in the moment. And, And that's exactly it in the moment. That was something that I learned was wrong because he, he realized early on when he started having these significant health challenges that he was on his path to his transition. And so we knew that it wasn't like we thought, oh, he's going to live forever. It was, what what do we want to do now that is is great for us right now? For instance, he, about, oh, a month and a half before he died, he had a birthday and a friend gave him a book that he really wanted to read. And he started to try to read it and he realized that he couldn't that with what was going on in his body, he just couldn't see the words on the page well enough to be able to read it. And and I could see that he was disappointed because he was trying to, and he was kind of struggling with it. And I said, how about if you let me read that to you? Mm. And it was fabulous. We sat outside on our lanai in the back and the nice weather outdoors here. And I read the entire book out loud to him. And it was precious time that we had together that was just in that moment. We were experiencing something that we could share and something that was positive. And we weren't worried about what was going to happen when we finished reading the book or what was going to happen tomorrow or what happened yesterday. We were just there together in that moment. And we, we really spent, the longer I was with him, the more time we spent in the moment and really the, the last couple of years of his life it was totally in the moment for both of us and it, I, I discovered it was such a beautiful way to live that that's how I choose to live now and that that doesn't mean that I don't have thoughts or ideas or plans for the future it means that all I'm concerned about is right now because I know that's really what all I have here well, and I find it funny that it is so easy 
to not live in a moment. There are so many things that distract us. I feel like all of life in some way is a distraction. It's like everything wants to distract us from what we're doing in the moment. And it takes oftentimes pain. Like C.S. Lewis mm-hmm. said that pain is God's megaphone for you. Like it, it awakens us oftentimes. And I think it's, it's in those moments where I experience pain where I'm able to see maybe being present would be the way forward. Because I think a lot of us, right, we either ruminate about the past and we live in these shackles that we really don't have to, but we keep replaying something shameful or something that either we did or happened to us. And we keep replaying it over and over and over on a track and we can't get past it. Or we're fearful of the future. But when we hit those two bumpers, we miss that we're alive right now. We miss the opportunity to be in the moment. And it sounds like as you were with Ron in those last days, you were finding ways in just the mundane parts of the day even to to be present, to be there. And how would you encourage us? Like, how how can we be present? How can we work on being present in the day-to-day? How can we be in the moment as we're going through life? The big thing is to pay attention. And Mm. what you pay attention to is what you're going to experience. And you were talking about pain. I can give you an example of physical pain with Ron. He had real significant issues that, that created physical pain. And had he dwelled on that, if that was what he was focusing on, it was much worse. But when he would, we would like, he loved music and we could play music and listen to it together and talk about the different performers and and what we liked about it. And when we were doing that, you didn't have as much room for the pain. Mm. And another example I'll give you is I used to teach Lamaze classes, childbirth preparation classes. And we would teach the people to do relaxation and to breathe in certain ways. And the reason that we taught them to breathe that way is because breathing is like the highest thing up in your brain of necessity that you have to breathe to be alive. And you, so it's normally we don't have to think about it. But if you were totally focused on breathing, then the other things aren't as important. So if you're breathing and really focusing on that breathing, then the pain isn't as significant. It doesn't mean you're not going to have pain in labor. It means that you're not dwelling on it. You're not magnifying it by concentrating just on that. You're concentrating on your breathing in a certain way that if you use total focus for that, then the, the pain isn't nearly as significant. So that's, that's the same sort of thing here. It's what you focus on, whatever it is, is what feeds you. When you're focusing on your breath work, you're not focusing on the thing that's bothering you, the thing that's scaring you, the thing you're ruminating on, or the anxiety about the future. You're focusing on this moment right now. And that can absolutely shift your perspective. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Like that's, we don't think like that, though. We think that we can think our way out of our situation. And I mean, as someone who has overthought once or twice in his life, I have never found that to be the answer, ever. It's never helped me. But focusing on the now has and figuring mm-hmm. out how to do that. That's right. I, I know I, one of the things that I, people that know me know I say commonly is to get out of your own way. Because mm. a lot of times we're the ones that are creating the issues or the problems. And it's not like, for instance, we create the pain But when we focus on it, that's what we get. And if you can get out of your own way by focusing on something else, then you can move forward in whatever it is that you're doing. And this image of getting out of your own way, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who are going through things. And what I've found for many people to be helpful is when they're able to kind of step away from whatever they're facing and you ask them, well, If you were an impartial observer of what was happening in your life, what would you say? Like, if this wasn't what you were dealing with, how would you look at it? And it's a useful tool, almost a trick to where we can be like, oh, okay, because 
when we're just staring at the wall, we feel like the wall goes forever. But if we take a step back from the wall, we're like, oh man, this is only like a three foot wall. I can get around this. But it's hard to change that perspective because it's very easy to lose the forest for the trees. It's so easy to just focus on one thing when if we just somehow change our perspective. And I think that's what you're getting at when you're talking about breath work. I think that's what you're Mm -hmm. talking about when you mention being in the moment. You're talking about different tools that we can use to shift our perspective while we're experiencing these two emotions simultaneously, while we're going through grief and while we're trying to move forward to happiness. And as I think about that, I, I really do wonder, like, so you would say being present and being in the moment can help us be happy even when we're going through a hard time? hmm Absolutely. Because it's what you focus on that, that you get. And I'll give you an example from a teaching writing. One of the first things that I teach in a writing class is a process called free writing. And it's very simple. You just have a certain designated period of time. And I used to do it at the beginning of every class for five minutes. That's how we started class. You, when the timer starts, you start writing and you don't stop until the timer stops. And it doesn't matter what you write. You just kind of empty out your brain. And what happens is I, I was always having students say, I don't know what to write about. I don't know anything interesting. There's nothing in my life that I can think of, or I don't know somebody I could talk. Yeah, that's this, I don't, I don't, I don't, is what comes out. If they write that on paper, your brain cuts kind of tired of saying the same thing over and over again, and it'll, it'll go off and do something else. And you can kind of, it's like emptying the trash. You get rid of all of it, and then there's room for something else. And I told him, I would ask in class, how many of you have problems with test anxiety? And almost everybody in the class always raised their hand. So I'd say, okay, use your free writing. Next time you have a test, go ahead and study for it like you usually do. Learn everything that you need to learn and then get to the class uh, like at least five minutes early and sit out in the hall and do free writing and let all that stuff come out. Like, I'm not going to pass this test. And if I don't pass this test, I can't graduate from college. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that comes out. And then they go in and take the test and all that stuff is gone. And the stuff that they studied and the stuff that they really do know is there and it comes out and they do much better on the test because they're not having that constant chatter in, in their mind. Yeah, I know something that works for a lot of people is this idea of if you're processing something, whether it's anxiety or pain, writing it down. And then doing something with the piece of paper that you wrote it down on, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like crumbling it up, throwing it away, burning it, whatever. It's, there's something in that symbol that can be cathartic. You know, it can, it can help us kind of be like a symbolic way of, I dealt with this. I'm going to put this over here now. And it sounds like as you're describing this free writing, there's something to that. I'm Mm -hmm. dealing with it. I think at its core, there's an acceptance that's happening because A lot of times when we have anxiety, we're just kind of in denial too. We're not really accepting that, okay, right now I have anxiety. Because if we, we think if we admit that we have anxiety, that's going to make things worse. But what it does is admitting it actually puts us in a place to do something about it. And Mm -hmm. it's funny because I went on the Camino de Santiago. The Camino de Santiago is a pilgrimage through Northern Spain and I remember as I'm there, I'm getting away from distractions and I'm really processing kind of what's next for me. And it was just a beautiful time. And I changed on that trip. There were some some very big changes that happened, but you only see how you changed in the ensuing months, you know, as you get back and you go back to the way life was before you left. And there's always chaos because when you've changed and you go back to the way things were, it's incongruent. Like you don't Mm -hmm. like, and so I I was just really processing it. It was hard. And what I found was as I went back to my journals where I was free riding during the Camino, I felt a connection. I felt it all came back. And so I love how you, you really do. You focus so much on writing to help people connect with what's true. Mm -hmm. And that's what really helped me because you get back and you're like, all is lost. Like, I guess I lost all that. But when it's written down, you can go back and you're like, no, there it is. And this is what happened. And this is what I was processing. And it just brought me joy and it got me back on track. And so I would encourage any listener, 
if you really do want to change, you don't have to be the most verbose writer ever, but just jot some ideas down and return to them when you're processing things or, or you're feeling nervous or because if you write it down, that can help you navigate as you move forward. Emily, how would you encourage our listeners as they're processing how to be happy as they're grieving? I always, I suggest two things. The first one is always self-care. Mm. That a lot of times when people are, are dealing with loss, they have a, a loss of their own self-image. They, they either eat too much or too little or they sleep too much or too little. They don't bathe, they don't brush their teeth, all all that sort of thing. And self-care just kind of goes away. And you can't feel good if you're not taking care of you because there's nobody else to take care of you but you. Right. So it's it's very important to practice good self-care. And then once you do that, then I always say write. And I strongly recommend a daily writing practice, having a journal and, and writing in it. I get uh, these little composition books at, at the store. I've got a ton of them. And back to school sales, you can buy them by the case. And I buy a case of them every year and I fill them up. Because I write every day. And every day I write in there. I start off with gratitude. And then I write about what my life is and what my life can be for a while. And then I write about the day, what is it that I anticipate for the day? And it's not like I'm going to be on a podcast or, you know, that sort of thing. It's, it's like today I want to remember to smile more often because I feel like mm. I, I haven't been doing that lately. And then after that, I write what I'm grateful for. And I don't just write, I'm grateful for my house. I write something about, I, I love, I'm grateful for living in this beautiful place where I'm so comfortable and I'm surrounded by good neighbors. And that, so you're, you're really kind of filling in the blanks with it. And then after that, I write something that brought me joy the day before. Mm. And that, that allows you to kind of reflect a little bit. And you'll find that you, there's something you can write about every day. And when you start realizing that you are feeling joy every day in spite of everything that's going on around you, that it's pretty good. And then, then I end with a, you know, a sincere thank you for everything and, and so much more. And by writing like that every day, I, I feel so much more grounded and I, I realize things like I, I am happy. I, I actually say I'm happier now than I ever have been. And when I first started realizing that, I thought, how can, I, how can that be? I'm by myself. My husband's aren't here. And I really love being married and being with my husband. But that doesn't mean that I can't be happy now. And doing all that writing helped me realize that. And I, I really, I, I feel a, a sense of freedom. I, another thing in my journal I, d- I do is I forgive anything, forgive me or forgive somebody else for any wrong that I perceive. Because if you carry around that thing that needs to be forgiven, it's really hard to move forward. Mm. So I, I include things like that too, to, to just kind of eliminate anything that doesn't serve you. Just release it and just focus on what's good about right now. Yeah. Eliminate the things that are distracting you from the now Mm -hmm. and centering on, okay, what's my purpose in this moment? Mm -hmm. I can't control what happened back then. I can't, I can't predict or control the future, but I can focus on what I'm doing now. And I love how you mentioned the word being grounded, how writing, how journaling kind of tethers you to the present. Mm -hmm. And there are journals that, I mean, I use a journal where it does almost like everything you said, like, but it has prompts. It'll say, what are you grateful for today? What do you want to do? What's one thing that you want to do today? And at the bottom, it has questions for self-awareness. What went well for you today? What could you change for tomorrow? And what I found is as I just kind of slowly but surely work through these, I start operating out of gratitude rather than scarcity. Mm -hmm. I start seeing myself more clearly rather than being blind. I start accepting things that maybe I don't want to see, but I accept them. And then I'm like, if I want to change it, I can. You know, it's just like, Mm -hmm. but, 
But writing down these things kind of tethers me to that moment. And it kind of, like, I loved how you said that it grounds me so that I'm able to actually operate in a way that's concrete, not just get lost in my thoughts. And I think that's what we all need. And so you really gave us so much to think about today. I really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Thank you so much for joining us, Emily. Oh, it was my pleasure to be here. I, I love to talk about this sort of thing because I know I'll let you help me. And I, I love to see other people be able to start moving forward themselves. If you are interested in more stories like this one, buy my book, Vulnerable Rethinking Human Trafficking. Also, if you want bonus content, you can click on the link in the show notes to access our new and improved weekly bonus podcast, More Mercy, where I dive deeper into each episode. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave MercyCast a five-star review. I want to hear from you. You can email me at info at mercycast.com. This podcast is brought to you by Let My People Go. To learn more about how you can love your most vulnerable neighbors through your own vulnerability, go to lmpg.org. Till next time, have mercy on yourselves and each other.